Welcome. Today, we're going to tackle something that sounds super complicated, but is actually one of the most powerful tools in all of health research, hypothesis testing. Think of it as the process that separates a good idea from proven science. We're going to make it simple, practical, and super clear. So to make this real, let's jump right into a story. Imagine a pharmacist in Kumasi, Ghana, has developed a new drug for hypertension. They think it's way better than what's currently available. But you know, in medicine, a belief or a hunch just isn't enough. You need cold, hard proof. So how do they prove it? Well, the answer is a structured process called hypothesis testing. It's basically a framework that lets us take that big research question, turn it into something we can actually test, and then use data to get a clear answer. Let's walk through it together step by step. Okay, so first things first, before you can even think about collecting data, you have to frame the problem. And the way we do that is by setting up two competing statements, like two sides of an argument. This is the foundation for everything else we're going to do. You know, the easiest way to wrap your head around this is to think of a courtroom trial. Our new drug? It's the defendant. It's on trial. And just like in any fair trial, we have to start with the presumption of innocence. We assume the new drug has no special effect until the evidence becomes so overwhelming we can't ignore it. And here are the two sides of that argument laid out perfectly. On one side, you've got the null hypothesis, which we call h naught. This is the innocent plea. It's the default position that, nope, there's no difference here. Then on the other side, you have the alternative hypothesis, or H1. This is the big claim our pharmacist wants to prove, that their new drug actually is better. So let's dig into that null hypothesis for a second. Think of it as the ultimate skeptic. It's the voice that says, any difference you see in your data is probably just random luck, just noise. Our entire job as researchers is to gather enough strong evidence to challenge and hopefully kick that skeptical idea to the curb. And then we have the alternative hypothesis. Now this is where the excitement is. This is the new idea, the potential discovery, the whole reason our pharmacist in Ghana started this journey in the first place. This is what we're hoping the evidence will point to. All right, so our courtroom is set. We have our two opposing arguments on the table. So now what? Well, now it's time to play detective and actually gather the evidence. And in health research, that means running a study. And this is a really systematic process. First, you collect your data. Give the new drug to one group, the standard one to another. Then you calculate the average results for both and see what the difference is. And finally, and this is so important, you take all that data and you boil it down to one single powerful number. We call that the test statistic. Okay, so let's imagine our pharmacist runs their study, crunches all the numbers, and out pops a test statistic. Because they're using a small sample of patients, this is often a T value. Let's say their T value is 2.8. Great, we have a number. But what on earth does 2.8 actually mean? Is that good? Is it bad? Right now, it's just a number. And that right there is the million dollar question. Is a 2.8 big enough to be considered real evidence? Or could a result like this have just happened by pure random chance, even if the drug was totally useless? To figure that out, we can't just stare at the number 2.8 by itself. It needs context. We need some kind of ruler to measure it against. And that's where these things called probability distributions become our best friend. Now, because a lot of clinical studies have to work with smaller groups of people, we often use something called the t-distribution. The absolute best way to picture this is to think of it as a map. It's a map that shows us every possible t-value we could ever expect to see if the new drug actually did nothing at all. And if you look at this map, you'll see a big hill right in the middle. That's where all the boring, common, just random chance results would land. But way out on the far edges, you see these small areas called the tails. Those are the rare zones, the, whoa, that's surprising regions. Okay, so this is the moment of truth. We take our evidence, our t-value of 2.8, and we find its location on this map. And look at that, it lands way out in the tail. This is a huge deal. It tells us our result is rare, it's an outlier. It is not the kind of result you'd expect to get if the drug had no effect. So things are looking really, really promising. The evidence seems strong, but in science, we need to be extra sure. We need one final piece of the puzzle to make our final call. And that piece of the puzzle is called the p-value. The p-value answers one very specific but very powerful question. It asks, 
If we assume for a moment that this drug is completely useless, what's the exact probability that we would get a result this strong just by dumb luck? So in other words, it's the probability that our result is just a fluke. So for our t value of 2.8, the math gives us a corresponding p value of 0 0.008. And just look at that number. That is a tiny, tiny number. I mean, let's really put that in perspective. A p-value of 0 0.008 means there is only a 0.8% chance, that's less than one time in 100, that our pharmacist results are a total accident. The evidence against that no-effect idea is now pretty much overwhelming. And this brings us to a simple little rhyme that every researcher lives by. In science, we usually set a cutoff point, often 5%, or 0 0.05. And since our p-value is way, way lower than that, we get to follow the rule. If the p is low, the null must go we officially get to reject the null hypothesis. So, our pharmacists can finally, and with total confidence, make this statement. The scientific method has worked. The data backs them up. They've shown their new drug is a success. The alternative hypothesis wins. And that's really hypothesis testing in a nutshell. It's this logical, powerful framework that lets us move from just a question to a real, evidence-based conclusion. It's how we push medicine and science forward. So now that you know how it works, what's the next big question you're ready to test?